Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where dreams are our compass, pointing us to the uncharted and the extraordinary. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I hope you to be SaaS founders like you scale from seven figures, which is good, to eight and nine figures, which is outstanding. Together, we supercharge revenue growth, create premium valuation, and craft a business you're proud of and a life of impact and freedom that you love. You ever have a dream that is so vivid you could taste it, but then you try and explain it and it sounds like a jumbled mess. Kind of like you're trying to explain maybe your favorite movie plot and accidentally leave out the main characters, you know, little details like that. I mean, the other person's like, sorry, I'm just not getting it. And it's it's frustrating because you're trying to explain it and giving it your best and just like, I don't know. And it can be really frustrating, especially when that is your corporate vision. You know, it's just not last night's weird taco induced dream. You know, something that really means something to you and you're trying to communicate that out to your team. But the difference in the business world is people just like nod and and then pay no attention when they don't get it. They don't say they don't get it. They're just like, yes, okay, whatever. And occasionally a company does extremely, extremely well at sharing that vision and getting everybody aligned around it. I mean, it shouldn't be an oddity, but it seems like it kind of is. One that comes to mind recently is PepsiCo. I drive by their big office here in Plano almost every day. It's an old, big, established company. They've been around for in various forms for 100 plus years. In 2006, they got a, a new CEO, and she was the powerhouse behind PepsiCo's transformation. She didn't just share a new strategy. She painted a vivid picture of a healthier, more sustainable future. And she called it performance with purpose and laid out the vision. And, you know, folks didn't just, you know, nod and go, yes, okay, whatever. No, no, no. They, they actually jumped on board the ship ready to sail to the horizon. I mean, they were committed all in. And the result was incredible growth, 80% revenue growth while she was there. 35 billion to 65 billion. That's a billion with a B. And that is not an easy thing to do in that market segment during a recession with an old brand that's been around forever. It's like, you know, to think about that 80% growth in, you know, 12, 13 years that she was there. It's amazing, amazing stuff. So what is the relevance to us? All right. Here we go, Dreamweavers. Let's break down the communication conundrum here. First and foremost, We want to simplify to amplify. If your vision needs a three-page manual to explain it, it is way too freaking complicated. Boil it down. Make it tweet-worthy. Make it memorable and shareable. Uh, Because, you know, if if you need some help with that, grab my book, Small Fish, Big Pond. It breaks down exactly how to do that. There are videos, resources that go with it. But the, the key here, the key element is just keep it simple. Because if someone can't remember it and explain it to a friend, there is zero chance of it working. So it has to be memorable and it has to be shareable. So that means it has to be simple. Next, we want to engage the emotions. Now, facts tell, but stories sell. And we all remember stories. And why is that? Well, it's how we connect. It's how we share experiences. And our experiences Well, that is our story. It doesn't have to be something crazy. It's just, it's life. It's the things that happen to us. So weave your vision into a narrative that that hits the heart. It'll connect and people will remember. And the most important part of that is to make your team or your clients, depending on who the, the story is for, but make your team or your clients the hero of your epic tale. They need to see themselves in your story, not as a side part, but as the hero, because it's it's that purpose that brings them together. And then they go out there and they execute that because they want to be part of that hero story. They see themselves in it. And then finally, we want to foster an open dialogue. Now, communication is two-way. And I talked a little bit about that on Tuesday. 
communication is two way. It's not a monologue. Imagine it like a, a dance, you know, two partners that like, choreograph together. And I'm a, I'm a terrible dancer. So how about we do dueling pianos? How about that? That's more my style. You know, back and forth, playing off each other. You know, do that. Invite feedback. Encourage questions. Make it a conversation that does go back and forth. You know, create a, a no judgment zone for brainstorming so that the you know, ideas can flow. You can share. You can, you can you know, figure this out together. Just a few simple ways to go from a mindless head nod, the okay, yeah, whatever, to enthusiasm, buy-in, and alignment that will completely change the entire course of your company. So you're ready to turn that brilliant idea in your head into a movement that sweeps through your organization. And let's transform vision sharing from a PowerPoint snooze fest to a rallying cry that echoes in every heart, that they just embody that. They want it. They align with it. So here is two crystal clear visions and teams that see it just as clearly as you do. I did mention my book, Small Fish, Big Pond, Building a World-Class Business that Swims Circles Around Competitors. It helps clarify strategic vision and rally your team around that vision. It also delivers powerful marketing and leadership lessons guaranteed to enhance your marketing message and wrap value around your clients and guide their buying journey to conclude that your company is the only solution for them. It includes step-by-step frameworks and time-tested growth principles to attract ideal clients, to convert them, and transform them into brand ambassadors. So pick up the print, ebook, or audio book today at smallfishbigpond.com, Amazon. And there's a special deal going on right now for Prime Week on Amazon. But to remember, always, all book profits, always, 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 they all go to charity. So pick up Small Fish Big Pond today. Our founder on Tuesday was Stacy Chan, an award-winning reporter and media expert turned SaaS founder. She co-founded a generative AI company called One Billion Stories that just launched their flagship product, Videofida AI. She helps brands and publishers scale video and social media creation. She talked about her founder journey, the transition, and Videofy, and how to use content to engage. Our expert guest last week was best-selling author, endurance, and strongman competitor Jason Criddle. He is the founder of Smarter Commerce and Smarter Marketing. We talked about having an athlete's mindset in business, along with SaaS investing, sales, marketing, and lots of things around business growth and having the right mindset to make that happen. So if you missed either one of those episodes, cue them up right after this one and give them a listen. My guest today is Leon Barnard, who leads the design education team at Balsamic. After 10 years in UX design in a variety of industries, he joined Balsamic to help teach wireframing and design inside and outside the company. He is the author of Wireframing for Everyone and also writes talks about remote work, web development, and UX career paths. Welcome a vision transfer specialist, Leon Barnard. Hey, Leon, welcome to SAS Fuel. Thanks so much for having me. Well, tell me a little bit about your background and what led you to your current role as design education lead at Balsamic. Sure. So I... Uh... I was a UX designer for close to 10 years. And so I learned so much about not just UX, but about kind of how to develop and design good software. And I realized so much of it is about the process. And, you know, it got me really excited about the ability to communicate with the right roles. And I really got hooked on wireframing. I felt like, oh, wireframe and low fidelity is really a good way to have conversations with the right people. Um, and so I did have an opportunity to join Balsamic, which was one of my favorite wireframing tools. And um, in this role, I really had a, a chance to try to help teach people about wireframing, um, both how to do it from a practical point of view and then also how to how to think about it. Cause I feel like it's it's kind of fundamentally it's its own thing. And so I've really enjoyed um spending time talking about wireframing and learning from others about it. And then um recently we wrote a book about wireframing to uh, me and two of my colleagues. And so that was really a fun opportunity to kind of condense everything that the three of us know about wireframing into one one resource. 
Excellent. So for those that are not necessarily as familiar with wireframing, I mean, tell us what it is and you know, where does it fit into the overall design and development process? Yeah, yeah, great question, because so many of these terms are overloaded or used in different ways. And I'm not so I'm not so strict about what you call it. Um, the earlier version of Balsamic was called mockups for a long time because that's what, uh, the, they called them at Adobe where our founder worked, uh, before he went off to, to do his own thing. So I understand, I, I get it that there's different names out there and they can be confusing. Um, and you know, what's the difference between a wireframe and a prototype, fidelity, low fidelity, high fidelity. Um, I think the simplest thing to do is really just uh, when we're talking about wireframes is just thinking of them as like a digital sketch, you know, so everybody understands what it's like to write on a whiteboard, draw on a piece of paper. And when I talk about wireframes, it's really um, a digital version of those kinds of things, or not even a non-digital version. A wireframe is something you can do on a, on a whiteboard or a piece of paper. And it's a good, that's a good boundary to draw around it. Like if you can't do it on a whiteboard, then maybe it's not a wireframe. If you expect it to be really interactive, then you're kind of bleeding into the into the realm of prototyping but if it's a user interface that you can draw on a whiteboard then then i would say that's a wireframe i like it and wireframing tools are not just for developers is that correct or are there other business functions that can use them well or should use them Yes, absolutely. And I think that's one thing that does also differentiate wireframing from some of the more pixel perfect um uh, prototyping or, or high fidelity design tools, um, you know, your uh, Adobe tools or, or, and things like that is that though a lot of those tools are meant for designers. Um, or, you know, there are some other tools that are spe- specifically meant for developers, but I think wireframes are meant to be very approachable, something that anybody can do. Um, before Balsamic, I knew a lot of people who did their wireframes in. PowerPoint or Keynote, I, yeah. I was one of those people, or some of these general drawing tools like Visio back in the day. And I, I think that's st- still the case. So if those are the tools you feel comfortable with, then then that means that you can do wireframes. So people on the business side, developers, designers, um, you know, they're they're meant to be very uh, accessible and approachable and kind of kind of intuitive. Um, so I think it's really something that anybody can use. I like that. Uh, I have done that before. I've done demos using PowerPoint of uh, here's what it's supposed to look like mm-hmm. or showing, you know, prospects that here's what it's going to look like, mm-hmm. something like that. So I think that that's really interesting. Does it help to get other people involved in that design process? I mean, kind of get the idea from the head out graphically so other people can really understand what it is that you're trying to communicate. I think that's a really good question because it's a very hard thing to to learn. And that's one of the things that came out in the book, which I think I didn't really understand until I had to write it down, which is that the, usually the very first stage of wireframing is just for you, whoever you are, whatever your role is. One of the things mm. that wireframes are good at is helping you kind of flesh out and see your own ideas. So I think it's good not to wireframe with other people at the very beginning because you have this idea in your head, you want to get it down, and then maybe you realize that it's not as clear in your head as you thought it was, or you know, just getting it down gives you another idea you kind of want to explore. And so if somebody was looking over your shoulder, they might have no idea what was going on because really you're just trying to get something out of your head and and you're going to put out bunch of stuff down that's that's a that's bad or really messy and so i think at the very beginning it's good to just kind of wireframe for yourself and then as you kind of iterate and then start to uh, you know raise some questions maybe or or start to want to talk to other roles then maybe you can go in and and try to maybe get rid of some of the messier parts and clean it up a little bit and say okay now i'm ready to involve somebody else now that i can i feel like i can explain it or it's at a point where you know there it's a little bit more put together so you know i would say that's kind of the the middle phase maybe when you start to bring in other people that's really smart. And I hadn't thought about using it that way, but it really does give clarity when you can get it from, from your own head, your own ideas down thing visual and you see it and you go, yes, I like this. No, I don't like that and kind of work through that on your own. I think that makes a lot of sense. 
yeah, it took me a while actually to come to that, that, that realization. So, um, that was one of the benefits, like I said, of having to write it down. <laughs> well, writing it down, tell me about the book. What's it called? Uh, it's called Wireframing for Everyone. Got a copy right here. <laughs> um, and we'll put a link in the notes, I'm sure. Uh, so yes. it's by myself and two of my colleagues at Balsamic. Uh, we all have design backgrounds, all from slightly different um, uh, companies and backgrounds. Um, and so we collaborated on it. And then we worked with the publisher, Book Apart, uh, who's published a lot of great books. And they were fantastic editors because uh, this is our first time writing something. So the beginning of the book is really kind of about why you should wireframe and some of these things about what what is the role of wireframes. And then we get a little bit into how to actually do it. And then some of the later chapters are really about how to, once you've got maybe a solid idea, to, idea how to actually get that into, into production. So how to wireframe as a team, how to present your wireframes, how to get feedback on them, you know, how to actually follow up once the wireframe is handed off or out the door so that you can improve because I feel like the people and the process are as important, if not more than, you know, the, the design itself. So how do human factors play into uh, design and uh, UX UI? Yeah. So I think the, the, the two, you know, that word human is really key because you have to be designing for someone. So, um, you know, you, if you don't have the right, understanding of the audience in mind, then you're not going to design a good, a good product. So you have to really be connected to the, the users. And that's why I think, um, you know, designers have to be connected to these business roles, like a business analyst or a product manager, or even the, the founder who maybe came from that ind- industry, some industry experts. And then, so it has to be really tied to that, the, the, the end user, but then it also has to be something that you communicate on your team. And so you kind of work outside of your silos and you make sure that you're not just coming up with a design kind of in a vacuum and then handing it off. And then the developer may not know what to do with it or know what you mean by something. So you kind of have to work with them in, um, along the process. We, in the book, we use this idea of like a a relay race in in track and field where you're, Mm, you're running your leg of the race, but you've also got that baton. And if you don't practice how to do those handoffs, you can't just work on running as fast as you can, you have to really, you know, you see how hard it is when they do that. And you see those times when they, they drop the baton because they're not in sync because they haven't practiced that. They don't know what the other runner is going to do. And yeah. so having a process on your team for, for doing these handoffs, I think is really important as well. I love that you have, you know, three different authors of the book. I mean, you're kind of approaching it from different angles and in your experience as well, you have, you know, various industries and how is that experience in uh, UX practice across industries influenced you in, you know, your, your development approach and your teaching approach as it comes to wireframing and design? Yeah, I think that's a good, a good question because, you know, especially it can also affect, it can also be affected by the type of company you work with, the type of yeah. teams. You know, if you're in a, a huge company with tens of thousands of people or it's a small startup, um, you know, it really varies. Um, so I think it's always good to start by getting to know the people on your team, um, finding out what, what information they have and having the right questions and then figuring out how you're going to answer those. So, you know, in some cases you're able to talk to the customers directly, or maybe you're designing some internal tools and you're designing for employees and you can interview them. In other cases, you're going to work with the sales team or the support team. Um, so you have to be a little, a little creative, I guess, in, in, if you're not able to find the answers you need to who is going to be using it. Um, how often are they going to be using it? What, what kind of data are they looking at here? Um, and so, you know, rather than just one of the, I guess one of the philosophies or teachings in the book is don't jump into the UI design too quickly if you don't mm. have a good understanding of who you're building for, or what their problems are. So whatever type of industry or company you work for, you know, have a good understanding of who your user is first and how you do that varies a lot depending on the the industry. But um, you should always start with that and not just jump into Oh, well, here's the UI design for it. And how does that work when you have the, the user and the, maybe the buyer are two different, uh, maybe two different functional areas, maybe two different places. 
Um, you know, it's that the buyer is, is making the choice, but the user has to live with the consequences of that choice. Uh, how does design factor into to that? Yeah, that's one of the, you know, when I talk to designers, that's something that they, they struggle with. Um, and I think you kind of have to design for both of them. Um, you know, maybe you're going to work on say the landing page or the, the resources that the, the buyer is going to be seeing. You're going to use that with, you know, by approaching it with a, a buyer persona or something. And then maybe once you get into the product, you're going to kind of have a user persona um, that you're going to design for differently. So maybe see those as two different types of users that you're designing for. Um, and again, kind of understanding who is who is the user that we're targeting here. Um, I love when companies have their own dedicated user researcher or user research department even. So people who are going to do surveys, who are going to do interviews with different types of users, whether those they are the buyers or the users or both. Um, and so you have somebody who can bring in not only the business goals, which are going to come from the business and sales side of things, um, but people who have some insights into the users themselves who are less invested in, okay, what's going to, you know, what are the customers with the, you know, the big contracts going to ask, uh, really asking for as far as the features, but someone who's going to come in a little bit more objectively and say, well, how is this going to affect the rest of the, the users? Um, and so I think that's really w- nice when you have a user research or some kind of research role in your department as well. That's really, really smart. Well, you mentioned not jumping to design too soon. Uh, what are some other principles or techniques that you focus on in the book or in your teaching uh, about wireframing and design, especially to, to people who are maybe a little bit new or newer to the process? Yeah. So design is also one of those really tricky words. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's maybe it's good to get rid of that word design because it's a little loaded and just think about there is a a creative process. There's an early phase ideation or brainstorming process or, you know, in design, they often talk about this double diamond or a, a divergent convergent process. So I think it's good to think about, okay, are we trying to narrow down here? Are we trying to converge towards one solution or are we in the early phases where we really want to come up with as many ideas as possible. And that can be called the, the um, divergent phase phase. So where you're really trying to be as creative as possible. And so that can often start with a lot of words. Um, so writing down words or ideas or creating like a site map or kind of a flow chart, I think is a really good way to start where you're just, you're kind of brainstorming, you're trying to draw connections between things. And so that actually is the process of design where it, it's very creative, it's divergent, but you're not thinking so much about, okay, what is this going to end up looking like just yet? Because when you toss around the word design, people think, okay, this is what it looks like to the end user. But um, I think you want to start with a different kind of design, which is just writing down words that are meaningful. It could be, okay, who are the users? What are their goals? Uh, what types of actions do they want to take? What are other factors that we need to consider? Those are actually the very early phases of design itself, which is just trying to narrow in on who you're designing for and then get to maybe think about in terms of like sticky notes, whether those are actual sticky notes, whether those are boxes on a whiteboard, whether those are digital sticky notes, kind of draw out maybe what some of the major features of the product are going to be, what some of the pages are going to be, start drawing connections between those. So try to think at that level that's a bit higher level than the the ui at first and that that is designing (laughs) yeah yeah well from the the book what are some key takeaways that you hope readers walk away with uh in you know wireframing for everyone i mean i'm in the everyone category so you know what Mm -hmm, are some mm -hmm. things that, that i should absolutely get as key takeaways from the book i think one is we just don't want wireframing to feel so intimidating or even mm. design or UI design overall to feel intimidating. And so um, the book starts out very slow by just showing you that this is not 
something new. This is just like sketching on paper. And, you know, now you can do it digitally. So when you, so you can copy paste and delete and edit and do all these things that are hard to do, uh, on a, on a whiteboard. And so this is a very old technique, you know, people have been doing this for hundreds or thousands of years, which is just coming up with ideas for things and coming up with solutions to problems, um, which previously were in the physical world, you know, whether it's designing furniture or, uh, an airplane or something like that. This is the same thing, but now so much of our world is software. So, um, it's not something that only designers can do. Um, it's not something that only any role can do. It's something that everybody can do. You just have to kind of get out of your head, this idea that, I'm building a user interface and then you start thinking about how am I going to code it? And, you know, uh, how is it going to be priced? And, you know, you kind of start, it's very easy to get ahead of yourself. So I think one of the big takeaways is don't get ahead of yourself. I know that, you know, you have deadlines and all of these things, but asking these questions, trying to get to the, to the root of a lot of this stuff is really going to save you time later because I'm sure a lot of your yeah. listeners have had experiences where they've shipped something and they realize that they missed the mark and then you have to go back and recode it or whatever. I mean, that's, yeah, that's we've done that, yeah. That time yeah. So that's one of the big takeaways. And then another one is that UI design itself is not actually that hard, especially these days. There's so many design libraries and patterns, you know, that you can really build off of what's been done before and you're not reinventing the wheel. A lot of UI design is very straightforward. There's a couple of just, there's a lot of basic patterns that you can follow. Um, and so once you get to the point where you know, you kind of have a direction that you want to follow, getting to the user interface design part is not as hard as you might think. Um, and then I think the, the, the last takeaway is just make sure you follow through to, you know, to the end. So make sure that you're involved in the process once it hands off to developers. Um, and so things kind of don't go off track there that you understand that you need to communicate, um, you know, past your, what might be your, your area of, of expertise. Oh, that's, that's really good. I think that's, that's interesting, just that, that there are design standards. It's not reinventing the wheel and, and building things mm-hmm. in a way that is familiar with users. And that makes it intuitive, not because it's you know brand new to them, but because it looks like things that they're familiar with already. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how do you see the, the role of UX and UI uh, evolving, you know, the design process? I mean, particularly the emergence of new technologies, AI, uh, lots of new tools out there. Where do you see it going uh, in the next few years? Yeah, I think, you know, in a lot of things, there's there's kind of this arc uh, where things are changing permanently, but there's also cycles there's kind of cyclical phases as well and i i do feel like there's a bit of a resurgence in interest in some of these more basic techniques about wireframing information architecture some of these fundamental things about um coming up with good designs and that it's not you know because these days tools can do everything so tools tools make a lot of the details that used to be hard easy and so it's the the thinking, it's the insights, it's the, the human aspects of it that are hard for the tools to do. And that's mm-hmm. where I think it, there's we're realizing there's more of a need f- for that. And so um, I think that's that's one trend, which is really kind of a, like I said, a, a cycle. I think another one with when you think about AI and some of these tools is that those can actually be leveraged to help you come up with lots of different ideas. So if you kind of, you know, you can input into a prompt, you know, to a uh, AI prompt, you know, give me 10 different user interface design ideas. And rather than thinking this is going to build my design for me, just think this is going to give me lots of ideas that maybe I wouldn't have come up with on my own. So um, again, I, I think it's really about working hand in hand with some of these new technologies and not just assuming it's going to do everything for you. Right, right. Yeah, I think you just assume that it's going to do it for you. The the results are pretty disappointing. But uh, you know, when you talk about <laughs> so ideas, far and, yeah, yeah, and and maybe that gets better over time. But when you use it to to start spark ideas, and you say, okay, well, if I take this one from number two, and this one from number seven, and this one from number four, if I put those together and I do it this way, yeah, you know, it's just that mm-hmm. the the human 
you know, working with the technology. I think you're, you're exactly right there. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see maybe five years from now, this will all be relevant and it'll do all of it for us. But, um, you know, I think it'll take a while until it gets to that point. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I hope. Certainly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll ever get rid of human designers. I mean, just the, the creativity and the human factors, because you're right. That's something that the AI can't really do it well, at least at this point. I mean, maybe one day. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just the, the human factors and, and just how are people going to perceive it? What are they going to do? Where are they going to spend their time? Well, Balsamic has been known as a user-friendly wireframing tool. It's been around for, what, 10 years or so? 15. Um, 15. So it has been a mm-hmm. while. And yeah. what sets Balsamic apart from other wireframing tools on the market or, you know, old school solutions like a whiteboard or something like Figma? How, how does Balsamic stand out of the market? Yeah, so we're one of the very few companies that really hyper focuses on wireframing, maybe the only one. Um, so all we do is wireframing. Um, you know, if you look at a tool like Figma, it, it allows you to do so much. It allows you to do everything. Um, which is great, but that can also be very overwhelming and it can, it can get you distracted yeah. from, um, what you should be working on, you know, depending on where you're at in the, in the project. So, you know, the, uh, we like to say that or, or joke that our biggest competitor is pencil and paper. I mean, that's what we're <laughs> sure. really trying to compete with that experience of, okay, I have an idea. Let me, let me draw it out, um, you know, on, on paper or a whiteboard. So we want it to really to be fast and so responsive that you just can get in the flow with it. And, you know, Balsamic, we, we have decided that the only way we can do that is if we really focus exclusively on this one activity of wireframing, which, you know, in the book, we try to explain it's not, it's not so simple. Yes, you can learn a wireframing tool in, in a matter of minutes, basically, but wireframing as an activity, there's a, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to learn. There's, there's a lot of considerations. And so we wanted a tool that's really, really dead simple to use and really focused on this one thing. And, and we feel like there's room for single purpose tools out there. Um, you know, as, as much as it is nice to think of the idea of having a, one tool that does everything. Um, I, I think that there are still, there's still a place for tools that just do one thing really, really well. Sure. Sure. And yeah, you know, I appreciate simple tools. I have used balsamic and, and it is, it is something that I can use and it's very easy uh, you know, somebody that is, you know, doesn't have a, a super deep technical background. And I look at things you know, like Figma and there, we've got people that they use that as well. And, uh, but yeah, I look at it and I don't get it. And it just, it, there's so much uh, difference just in the learning curve. And could I get there? I'm sure I could. I just don't want to spend the time and invest that in, into a tool like that where balsamic, I can just load up and have something in just a, a few minutes. Uh, and then we can start working on that and iterating immediately instead of having to, to build something more elaborate. So I can really appreciate yeah. simpler tools. Yeah. And that fil- filters down to a lot of things. I mean, Balsamic is a, is a fairly inexpensive tool. So, you know, we, we can say, Oh, you know, you can have your Figma, but you can also have Balsamic and it's not yeah. going to break your budget. And we're a small company. We're about 30 people after 15 years, which is tiny, um, you know, and still remaining relevant, I think is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. So, you know, there, there are advantages to being small and being niche as well. Yeah. That's definitely true. There's, there's certainly a place in that, the market. And when you, you, you know, in the book I talk about, you can, to get big, go small and you really focus on a, a very a specific problem, a very specific, you know, user group, you know, ideal clients. And, and that's really how you build a, an amazing company as you really focus in and solve a, a big problem. And I think that's one of the places where Balsamic really shines is in, in solving a problem very elegantly. Um, you know, the, the technology, I think, is is pretty complex in what it does, but from a user perspective, very simple and easy to use. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That means a lot because that's exactly, you know, that's kind of the principles that we, we operate by. So what are some mistakes that companies make, particularly, you know, SaaS and, and you know, creating products or new features, uh, either using wireframing or not using it? I think kind of discounting the value of it or not seeing it as a separate step, you know, and this goes back to a little bit what I said about design uh, earlier that, 
you know, for people who are people who are designers or people like me, they see all of the different sub phases within design. But, you know, if you're a, a founder or a business person, um, you know, design to you just kind of looks like maybe a black box. Uh, and so, you know, your ideas come in and then this UI design concept or prototype comes out and then the developers build it. But um, I think it's really worth seeing it as multiple phases. And so one of the mistakes is jumping into the UI design uh, too quickly and saying, okay, I have an idea for something and then I'm just going to, I got to get it down in my design tool and then hand it off. Um, but your first idea is often not your best idea. You know, at least, you know, spend a little bit of time playing around, just have a little, give yourself a day or an afternoon even and say, I'm just going to experiment a little bit and come up with a, I'm going to put down my first idea and I'm going to see what my second or third or fourth ideas look like. And if I get any inspiration from that. So just dwell on that a little bit and take the pressure off of yourself to come up with the perfect or the right design and see, see what happens. You might see something that you didn't know coming into it. And that's really those are the breakthrough moments that you want. And I think that's what can happen if you allow yourself to sit down with a, a wireframing tool that's kind of meant for that ideation phase and that isn't going to guide you directly towards one solution. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be a lot of time, but I think it, it can really reap a lot of rewards if you just spend a little bit of upfront time just kind of playing around with the, with the problem a little bit more. I like that. You write and speak uh, a lot about remote work, your remote worker uh, yourself. And what are your thoughts about the future of remote work, uh, particularly in the design industry and in, in IT? Balsamic was remote, uh, has been remote from the very beginning. Um, so before, before, before COVID, it was cool. Um, yeah, before it was <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, and so we've definitely learned a lot about remote culture. I think one thing that's nice uh, from a technology point of view is is having this multi-person collaboration uh, or these new collaborative features within tools that are kind of an industry standard these days. You know, mm -hmm. uh, however many years ago, it used to be super cool when you go into Google Docs and you'd see another cursor in there and somebody else typing and it right. kind of blow your mind like, oh, are, are my changes going to be overwritten? You know, I mean, that was such a huge problem so long ago and they've kind of, they've kind of cracked it now. So, um, you know, Figma does that. Balsamic, that's one of the new things that Balsamic added several years ago is now you can have multiple people collaborating on the same the same document, the same file. And so I think that's been a breakthrough is that you can have synchronous work. You can kind of replicate what might happen in a, in a meeting room, um, both in your design tools, in your other productivity tools, in your communication tools. Um, you can have a face-to-face, -face, you know, Zoom meeting while you're designing. And so being able to replicate a lot of those in-person experiences is good. Um, but it's still, it can still be easy when you're away from those things to get a little bit siloed. And so I think it, it, it takes, it takes practice. And I mean, Balsamic is very small. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're able to do remote well. But honestly, companies that are a thousand or more people, I really don't know how they do it. I don't know how they don't just aren't just drowning in Slack messages. So um, it, <laughs> yeah. it's tricky. I, I, I can understand why CEOs want people to return to the office, but I think just for so many people, remote is, is such a good way to work. So yeah. I don't really know where things will be in five years, but I don't think it will be back to the way it was where everybody's supposed to be in the office. Yeah, I think you're, you're right about that. Well, being remote, how do you maintain a healthy work-life balance and, and prevent burnout? Uh, well, I don't always. Um, <laughs> but, Me either. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> right. I know. Who, who, yeah. who does? Um, That's but, partially why uh, I'm asking. How can I, how can I fix this? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I have a, a family and I think that helps to give some natural structure. So, you know, at the end of my day, that's when the, the kids are starting to get hungry and we're getting food together. And so there's, you know, there's definitely a pull for me to stop working because I need to be a bit, a bit, um, sorry, I need to be available for dinner. Um, same thing in the morning, getting the kids ready to go to school. Um, but also that's something we established early on at Balsamic is that, you know, those working is, is kind of the 
the time zones are kind of a, a sacred thing. So we have a golden hour, which that's what we call it, where we overlap um, in the mornings, which is, you know, 8 a.m. my time, which is a little early, but it's 5 p.m. Uh, in Europe. And so that's a little bit late for them as well. So we try not to have meetings um, across you know, continents, uh, outside of that time. We try not to send messages late at night. You know, we say you can turn on your do not disturb features or whatever. So there's not this expectation that you're replying to emails in the middle of the night to that anything, everything can, can wait. So embracing this kind of asynchronous workflow. Um, and our CEO has been really good about that. So he doesn't, um, he doesn't send you messages in the middle of the night that you're expected to re- reply to. So I think that's one of the cases where, where, that culture comes top down, um, unlike a lot of other uh, other cultural things. So just setting that expectation that you don't need to be available at all times. That's a good one, and that's that's hard for me because I've we have a team in Europe as well, and I'll send messages sometimes, and it's you know five o'clock our time, but it's you know so th- you know three a.m. their time. And uh, sometimes I get a reply back and it's like, no, 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 I was just sending that because I'm thinking about it right now. And if I don't, I'll forget. Not that I expect. Right, you exactly. You don't want to respond. not write yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Having those, those mm-hmm. boundaries is so important and making sure that yeah. the team really understands that they're not expected to be 24-7 uh, unless it's an emergency. And, and most things are, are not even things that we think are emergency sometimes are. Right, right. Wait. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll I'll check my email or I'll check Slack like on a Sunday night or something just to see if there's see what I might be dealing with when I get up in the morning, you know, yeah. but not reply to anything, but you know, just to have an idea, okay, is there something really big going on that I should be aware of and just to kind of check in. So, you know, I I I check email and Slack on the weekends and at night sometimes, but I, I generally don't really feel like I, I need to reply. Yeah. Well, looking back over your career journey, you have a lot of time spent, you know, making great software and helping other people do the same thing. What's one piece of advice you wish someone had given you uh, early on? Uh, I think that the people are such an important and overlooked consideration or a part of the process, specifically the people on your team, the other people in the organization that I, you know, I've seen so many examples where you have a great design that never makes its way to the customer. And, you know, you have to learn about, I, I'm a little bit frustrated sometimes with some of these design boot camps. They teach you all these UX and UI techniques and tools, but they don't teach you about agile software development and the, you know, the, what it's like to actually work in a technology or a software team and, and uh, competing, sometimes competing needs and interests of all the different roles, you know, how to actually get your product built, how to kind of leverage your soft skills. Um, and so that's what I wish that I would have been taught, which is the importance of building relationships with the people that you work with. Um, cause that's much more important than being a fantastic designer. You have to really it's the soft skills and being able to negotiate and um, and those sorts of things. That's really good. It comes back to human factors. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's not just the yeah, technology or the people. tools. Yeah, it's all about people. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, where can people learn more about you and about Balsamic online? Uh, so Balsamic is balsamic.com with a, a Q at the end uh, to differentiate it from the, the vinegar. Um Wireframing for Everyone is on the A Book Apart website, or you can just go to balsamic.com slash book to find out all about it. Um, I am at Leon Barnard on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, as long as those tools are still around. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'd be happy to hear from anyone who has questions um, or uh, you know wants to learn more about the book. Very good. Leon, yeah, really enjoyed having you on the show today. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. I, I enjoyed our conversation as well. Thanks again, Leon, for coming on the show and sharing your insights and resources. Be sure to check out Leon's book, Wireframing for Everyone. It is a great way to tangibly share vision and get things out of your head and into someone else's effectively. You can learn more about Leon at balsamic.com, and that's balsamic with a Q. All links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com and, of course, on our YouTube channel. Subscribe, follow, tell a friend about us for sure. 
Everyone who subscribes this week gets a Dream Decoder helmet. Put that thing on. Just describe your wildest vision or dream. Pop on your helmet, and it translates your aspirations into a language everyone can understand. Perfect for those value-had-to-be-there well, moments. Then join us next Tuesday, where our founder is Thomas Knoll, who, after working at a bunch of startups, he built five of his own with two exits, a few failures, and thousands of lessons learned. You won't want to miss Thomas. He is fantastic. And then next week on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, we have Vlad Hu. He is a SaaS consultant and fractional CTO with a sharp mind and eye in crafting SaaS MVPs that get traction and scale into profitable organizations. I will see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.